And now Luke 8, 22 through 25. Of all the paintings and pictures that I I found, this is the one that that, uh, seemed to strike me the most. This is the one that really shows how how much in danger they really are. So, let's see. Jesus calms the storm. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped. And they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. In verse 23, it says, they were in great danger. And that is very true. They were in great danger. I have to put this into a little bit of context there. This is the Sea of Galilee. If uh, you have maps in the back of your Bible, you'll notice that, that uh, there's kind of two main bodies of water in that area. One at the bottom is the Dead Sea, and then there's a smaller one up top that's called the Sea of Galilee. It's called by a couple other names too. But uh, that's the one on the top. That's where, that's where they are. It looks small on the map, but really what it is is it's a small sea that's way below sea level, but it's surrounded by mountains. And so what happens is that this Sea of Galilee had sudden storms frequently. So because there were certain passes in the mountains, there would be cool air that would go through there, and then suddenly, just out of nowhere, there would be this wild and raging wind. And so the Sea of Galilee had storms on a regular basis. This was not, this is not a new thing, this wasn't, this wasn't uncommon. It wasn't like there were storms there only once every 10 years. This was a common, regular thing that everybody just knew. And Jesus' disciples, especially the ones here who would have been uh, guiding and sailing this boat, these were fishermen who worked this lake, third shift at that, for a living. So they didn't fish during the day. In the day, the fish would go into the the deep water and they would hide. At night, they would come closer to the surface and then they would go to areas around the lake where there were springs and places where there was more oxygen in the water. And so that's when the best time to fish would be. So if you were a fisherman back then, you worked third shift. There was no other real shifts to work unless you wanted to make a living. So, for being fishermen, on the Sea of Galilee, that has a lot of storms, storms would be routine things for them. Storms would be something that they would, oh, there's another storm. It would be a regular occurrence. This would be something that they would be used to. Right? And even today, just in look, looking at, looking up some things for this, this, uh, this passage here, even today, captains and watchmen on, on uh, boats that sail the Great Lakes, at least, uh, they're notoriously calm under stress. So, how many of you heard of the Edmund Fitzgerald? Okay, almost everybody. That is the biggest ship that was ever lost on the Great Lakes. And um, if you know the story, there was a boat following it on this really bad November storms, one of the gales of November. There was a boat following it, 
And then all of a sudden, it just disappeared off of radar. It was having problems. It had reported some problems, but they thought, okay, we, we can get through this. But then all of a sudden, it was gone. No trace at all. This, the boat that was following it just lost sight of it. No distress call, nothing. The last, the last transmission that was sent out of the Edmund Fitzgerald was, we're holding our own. Okay, this, this is a boat that is about to be lost in Lake Superior. And in the, uh, the second largest vessel ever to be lost, was actually lost on Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan, by the way, is the deadliest of all the Great Lakes by far. Not only in ships and shipwrecks, but also in swimmers and drowning deaths for, for swimming too. There was a 640-foot boat that was considered the queen of the Great Lakes. And they were on 20-foot waves back in 1958, and everything was going fine, and then suddenly the entire back of the boat just broke off. And they had just enough time to just shout out a couple maydays before they went down. Now the Great Lakes, like the Sea of Galilee, are freshwater lakes. Fresh water is much more dangerous to sail in than salt water. You're worse off sailing a storm in the Great Lakes than you are in the oceans. Because the ocean water is salt water. It has more buoyancy. It has more minerals in it. Fresh water, boats sink a lot lower and so it's much easier for the waves to go over those boats. It's more hazardous. The waves even are different. And I'm not an expert on this, but from what I looked up, the waves are sharper. They kind of go up more like that. They strike quicker and they jump and tumble rather than roll and swell. So in the ocean, there's more of this kind of a thing. In the Great Lakes, it's more, more chaotic. It's much more difficult to navigate. So these were, these were seasoned fishermen used to storms on a lake that they knew very well, and they were afraid. In other words, this was a serious storm, and they were just moments from death. The couple worst Great Lakes disasters, Edmund Fitzgerald didn't even have time to get a distress signal out. The other one barely had enough time. Okay, here's the people who are normally calm under pressure, and they're saying to Jesus, we're going to drown. Okay? They're, that's, they're at their last, at their last moments there. At this point, they're like, we're going to die. Now, if anyone could have survived a heavy storm, it would have been them. They knew these lakes. And yet, they are resigned to, we're, this is it. This is it. We're not going to survive this. In fact, the words there where it says, we're going to drown. He, uh, in Greek, it's actually just one word, which could be, we're dying. Or in the King James, it says, we perish. Just one word, we're dying. This was a big deal. This must have been an extraordinary storm, and they must have been in extraordinary peril. Now, 
Isn't drowning a valid thing to worry about? Wouldn't you think that, you know, being safe on shore would be kind of an important thing? Not drowning to your deaths and on, on a lake when you were just going to cross over? Isn't drowning something to be concerned about? I mean, picture yourself on that boat. Picture yourself in that boat and you can barely tell where the boat is still above water anymore. It's washed over. It was completely swamped, it says. Imagine seeing that and the waves are still coming. Your boat's about to disappear from under your feet. And likely likelihood is that you don't know how to swim, at least not very well. Wouldn't you be worried? Wouldn't that be a little frightening? And apparently, if that was you, you don't have to be afraid, not if Jesus is with you. And we're not talking just Jesus physically in your boat. We're talking about the Jesus that's in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You notice that Jesus didn't say, it's a good thing you woke me up. That was a big one. That was a close call there. Good thing thing you, uh, you woke me up in time. He could have said that, but he didn't. Instead he says, where's your faith? Where's your faith? In other words, why are you afraid? In Matthew, he says that very thing. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? It's almost like he's saying, you drama queens, get over it. They're about to die. And people who are not exactly drama queens here, these are sailors who are hard and tough guys who don't panic, and they're panicked. And they're convinced they're going to die. They probably were going to. And he's like, where's your faith? Look at uh, the screen here with me if you would. What does the fourth request of the Lord's Prayer mean? Give us today our daily bread means do take care of all our physical needs so that we come to know that you are the only source of everything good, and that neither our work and worry nor your gifts can do us any good without your blessing. And so help us to give up our trust in creatures and to put trust in you alone. Our God is the only source of everything good. If there's something that we need, something that we want, We need to look to God for it. And nothing that we do, our work, our worry, our gifts, it can't do us any good without God. And so, we need to remember that. Why are you so afraid? So when you are afraid, and we're all human beings here, we're all going to be afraid at some time or another because we're weak. We're weak. To dispel our fears, the trick is to remember who is with you always. When you feel afraid, remember who is with you. And not just in an imaginary sense. He's with you in a very real way. In fact, Jesus' last words in Matthew when he gives the Great Commission, you know, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. And he ends by saying, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He wouldn't have said that if it wasn't true. So Jesus is with us. We can take confidence in that. We can feel good about that. We don't have to be afraid because of that. Even if There's a boat that we're in and we are going to drown. 
We don't have to be afraid. We might feel afraid, but we don't have to be afraid. In verse 25, you notice how the, the disciples reacted. It says, in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? Okay? Now, we know because we know the rest of the story, what happens, he died, rose again, and, and ascended to heaven, he's king of the universe and all that. We, we know what happens, but for them, this, they had just witnessed something that had never happened in the history of the world before. They had called him master, but they didn't realize how great of a master he was. Throughout history, there is no person that has stopped a storm on a dime like this. Nobody in recorded history is supposed to have stopped a storm like that. In fact, when I was reading through uh, some of these Great Lakes stories, it says it usually takes three days for a storm to blow in and three days for it to blow over. That's a, a maritime rule of thumb on the Great Lakes. So storms, they don't just come and go like that, or at least in the Sea of Galilee, they might come like that, but they just don't quit like that. And yet he did, just by a couple words. Quiet, be still, it says. Jesus is more than a prophet or a teacher. He is the king of creation. In the book of Job, one of the things that God says to Job to demonstrate how much he is God, he says, do the lightning bolts report to you? Do they report to you saying, here I am? Whenever I'm watching a storm and I see lightning, I always think of that verse. That lightning bolt had to report to God and said, okay, I, I, I was there like you told me to. In the Old Testament, it said that only God starts and stops storms with a word. And now, here's this human being. This human being who comes and he just says a word to the storm and it's gone. It stops right now. Who is this? In Romans 8, it said, nothing can separate us from Christ. There's nothing that can separate us from Christ. And if that's true, if we believe that, then we have nothing to fear. We don't have to be afraid. Even if we're looking at death right in the eyes, and our boat is about to sink in a matter of seconds, we don't have to be afraid. It says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. So we might feel afraid. That'll happen. But we don't have to be afraid. So even, even things like torture and death have no power because Jesus went through them first. Those kinds of things, I mean, Jesus went through it almost like, look, I'm going to show you that this is nothing to worry about. And then he went through it, came out on the other side, said, look, see, you don't have to be afraid even of these things. And the Bible is full of passages and verses about not being afraid. Old Testament and New. Just, there's too many to go through here. But there's, there's one that kind of stands out. Psalm, Psalm 91 just kind of stands out to me. It says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. Pestilence being like a storm. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. 
His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. In other words, God is faithful, so you don't have to worry. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Those are some things to be afraid of, and quite a few people are afraid of them. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Plagues were a very real scary thing back then. And this part, a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. There may be a thousand or ten thousand that's going to fall right next to you, but it's not going to happen to you. We don't have to be afraid. That's pretty cool. If you have a God who's this faithful and this good, we don't have to be afraid. If Jesus is with you, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. You might feel afraid. That's just part of being human. But you don't have to be afraid. If you catch yourself feeling afraid, all you have to do is remember who's with you. In fact, don't let your fear mess with your focus on Christ. Focus on Christ and fears take flight. That might be a good, good one to stick in your head. Focus on Christ and fears take flight. Never let your feelings of fear change your focus on who is with you. Jesus is everything. If you have him, you don't have to be afraid even when you're going to drown. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Dear God in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, help us to remember that you're always with us. Whether we can sense you with us or not, Lord, you've said that you're with us and so we will believe it. Whenever we feel afraid, please remind us that you are there. And remind us, Lord, of your faithfulness and your goodness. And how, Lord, no matter what danger or obstacle we are facing, Lord, that we are more than conquerors through you who loved us. We pray that this would be a very real thing to us, not just something that we think about. Let us not be afraid, but to put our trust in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.